we're very happy you're here and we're very happy to partner with HVA and we're happy Dr. Wolfson is here and, and Rabbi Sherry, our great partner, Rabbi Sherry. And I'm gonna pass it over to our friend, Laura from HVA to uh, introduce, introduce our scholar today. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. And the HVA is proud to be co-sponsoring this. Um, so we are happy to be here. Dr. Ron Wolfson is the Finger Hut Professor of the Education at American Jewish University in Los Angeles, where he has been on the faculty for 46 years and president of the Kripke Institute. He is the author of 17 books on Jewish life, including Shabbat, Passover, Hanukkah, God's to-do list, the seven questions you're asked in heaven, the spirituality of welcoming, relational Judaism, the relational Judaism handbook, a memoir, the best boy in the United States of America, and his latest book with Dr. Bruce Powell, Raising A-plus Human Beings, Crafting a Jewish School Culture of Academic Excellence and AP Kindness. On a personal note, I have had the pleasure of learning from Dr. Wilson many times over the past many, so many years. And um, I will say that although I as a learner seem to get old, the information he shares never does. And I am uh -huh. looking forward to this tremendously. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Smooley. Thank you, Rabbi Sherry. Thank you. Hi, HEA people. Hi, Valley Beit Midrash people. It's so nice to be with you. Uh, I have a special shout out just to get, get started. You know that Reb Shmuley's new book is coming out, The Five Ounce Gift, about his living kidney donation. And we share that. I donated my kidney two years ago on behalf of my wife, Susie, who needed a kidney transplant. Uh, at the uh, Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester three weeks before the pandemic hit. So guess what? We got locked down there for almost eight months. Uh, and Susie's doing great. Uh, my kidney went to Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida to a woman named Sally, who a couple of days after she received my kidney, wrote me the most beautiful thank you. Rev Shmuley, I'm sure you got a similar a uh, note of thanks from your recipient. Uh, and she had clearly Googled me uh, because she knew a whole lot about me. And you know, all they give you is the name and your email address, but she had Googled me because she wrote, I feel so honored that, I, that, that you write books of Jewish wisdom because I myself am a Christian educator. You're a Jewish educator. I'm married to a Southern Baptist minister and I feel so blessed to have received a Jewish kidney. <laughs> How is that? I think it's just fantastic. And then a couple of days later, she wrote that um, she named my kidney and her body Solomon in my honor because I write books of Jewish wisdom. Well, I'm excited to share with you one of my books, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven. You know, for years I've been fascinated with this. Um, the many stories in our tradition about rabbis who imagine that when we get to heaven, we're gonna be asked questions about how we lived our lives on earth. This is not about how to get into heaven. This is about the review of uh, how we lived our lives. Some of you might remember the great Albert Brooks movie many years ago called Defending Your Life, where he goes to this place where there's video of how he lived his life. Well, I don't know that we're gonna have video, but, uh, but anyway, uh, this is a process we call in Judaism, cheshbon hanefesh, the accounting of the soul. You know, cheshbon is the Hebrew word for bill, an account, and nefesh is the word for soul. So this is all in this tradition of how to think about how you've lived your life on earth. So in my book, I look at seven questions. Five come from Rava, a rabbi in the Talmud. And we'll look at that text in a minute. And one comes from an 18th century Hasidic rabbi you've probably heard of named Rabbi Zusya. And one comes from a 19th century founder of modern orthodoxy, Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch. So those are the seven questions we're gonna look at today. Uh, but before we look at the text, I have to tell you, I spent two years 
asking everybody I met, when you get to heaven, what do you think you're going to be asked about how you lived your life on earth? So I want to ask you, if, if you can, write in the chat the questions you think you'll be asked when you get to heaven about how you lived your life on earth. Can we get a few in the, did you give more than you took? Reb Shmuley asked. Good. How about someone else? Put a, a question in the chat. Did you make the world a better place, Miriam says. Linda, have you loved others? Andrea, we're the best you you could be. Dingo, did you give tzedakah? These are, these are great, great questions. Wonderful questions. Well, uh, my mother, Bernice, may she rest in peace, knew I was writing this book, so I asked her this question. Hey, mom, when you reach heaven, what do you think you'll be asked about how you lived your life on earth? She thought about it a minute, and then she said, I think I'll be asked, was I a good mother? Was I a good wife, a good daughter, a good sister? I said, great, mom, those are, but those are questions about family. How about the questions about how you lived your life, what you did in your life? And she thought a minute and she said, was I honest in my businesses? My mother, uh, we're gonna put the text up now. My mother was, um, a businesswoman from the time she graduated college, an amazing woman, amazing woman, my mom. She, she uh, had a, a series of donut shops. She was a, in an advertising business. She was in business. And uh, here comes the first question, according to Rava. So uh, we're gonna look at this text on the left-hand column. And if you go one, two, three, four, five, six, lines down, this is, um, this is the text we're gonna look at. The Gemara presents an alternative explanation of the verse that they had just studied. Omar Rava, Rava said, the shahashamachnisina dam ladin. When they escort a person to his final, his or her final heavenly judgment after his or her death, Omrimlo, the heavenly tribunal says to him or her, here comes the first question. Nasata venatata veemuna. Literally, the give and take. Did you do the give and take? Did you conduct your business transactions faithfully? What? That's the first question you're going to be asked in heaven about how you lived your life on earth? Not, did you give tzedakah? Not, were you a good person? Not, did you follow the mitzvot? No. The first question is going to be, can you believe this? Were you honest in your business? I would extend it to your professions. So you know what? I think that what this means is, I try to get underneath the question in each question. What, what is the rabbi really trying to ask of us? It's about relationships. And in my um, book, I tell little stories. I share little stories about how this illustrates the text. So in this case, I tell the story of uh, Antoinette Matlins, who is the wife of my publisher for many years of Jewish Lights books. Uh, she is an expert in uh, fine gemstones. And um, she told me the story, she knew I was writing this book, and she told me the story that once she was on a cruise ship giving workshops on how to evaluate a fine gemstone. And in the audience that day was a guy sitting like this, like, you know, I, you can't tell me anything. And Antoinette knew there are some people like that, fine. And the next uh, thing she knows after the end of the workshop, this guy comes up to her and says, you know, at the port we're reaching tomorrow in the Caribbean, I'm going to my favorite jeweler. I've been buying from him for 30 years. My wife and I are celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary and I'm gonna buy five beautiful diamonds and make a ring for her. Antoinette said, okay, fine, have a good port visit. Uh, in the workshop, she had taught about a loop. Any of you know what a loop is? It's the 
little magnifying glass that you use to look inside of a stone. And uh, so the next morning, this guy comes up to Antoinette breakfast and says, you know, before I go see the jeweler, Antoinette, can I borrow that loop? And Antoinette was thrilled and said, sure, here it is. He goes to the jeweler, he walks in the store, the owner is very happy to see him. He tells the jeweler, I'm looking five of your, for five of your best diamonds. He says, no problem. He goes in the back, he comes out with the black felt tray with these five diamonds on it. And only then did this man pull the loop out of his pocket to look inside the stones. And what do you think happened next? He grabbed the tray away from this guy and ran to the back whispering something like, oh, I remember something better just came in. This guy was devastated. This guy couldn't believe it, that he had been probably cheated all these years that he had bought from him. And he came back to the ship and he hands the loop back to Antoinette and says, Antoinette, I'm so happy that you taught me about the loop because I not only used it to see the imperfections in the stones, but the imperfection in the jeweler. So this first question is about your relationships in your business, in your professional life. Did you, did you treat everyone you encountered in your life, whether in business or in your profession, the emuna faithfully. Let's look at the second question. Here I'm online. Uh, uh, we're now one, two, three, four, five, six lines down in that paragraph. Kavata itim la Torah. Did you set fix aside fixed times for Torah study? Well, Mazel Tov, you're all in. You're here at the Valley Bait Midrash, so you fixed the time to study Torah today, and I'm sure you. Fixed many times for Torah study. Now, why is that important? The key word is fixed time, so that you remember to always study Torah, so that it can be a path to four things, a path to meaning, what's it all about? A path to purpose, what's the purpose of my life? A path to, to uh, belonging, especially if you belong to a sacred community, a synagogue, a minion, because you have a, a group of friends who are gonna be with you as you go through life, and a place to celebrate the many blessings in our lives. That's what Torah study does for us. Torah is the way we hear God's voice. Prayer is the way we speak to God. So keep doing your Torah study. That's the second question you'll be asked in heaven. Here's the third question. Uh, now we're on the line of Torah study. You see, it says Torah study. Now here's the third question. Asakta befria uravia, pru urvu. Did you engage in procreation? Did you have children? Now I have to be honest with you. This is a tough question for many people because there are people who want to have children and they can't have children as much as they try. And there are people who decide not to have children. So I'm wondering what's underneath the question? What's underneath the question is a question of legacy. Did you leave a legacy? Whether it's your own children or you influenced other children. My legacy, I'm the legacy of a guy named Louis Paperni, he was my Zadie, my grandfather in Omaha, Nebraska. He was a short man, he was about five foot tall. He came from Minsk, Bernia, he ended up in Omaha, Nebraska because the Union Pacific Railroad started in Omaha, Nebraska and went to San Francisco, the Golden Spike Railroad. So my grandfather started as a fruit and vegetables peddler. He had a cart and that became a, a roadside stand. And that became one of the first modern supermarkets in all of Nebraska. So I grew up in the grocery business with my Zadie Louie. When I would come over to Bubby and Zadie's house to see them, 
Bobby was always in the kitchen making some Michael, some great Jewish dish. I would grab some Bobby's cookies. Those were bundle bread studded with almonds and dipped in cinnamon sugar. I'd go through the dining room into the living room where Zadie sat in a big red chair. A big, it was like his throne because he was the king of our family. There were nine of us grandchildren. Next to the chair was a side table with three things on it. I brought them to show you. This was the first. A package of Camel's cigarettes, unfiltered. He smoked four packs a day. The second was this, a silver plated Ronson cigarette lighter. Do some of you remember this kind of lighter from your youth, right? I inherited this from my Zadie. It's one of my most prized possessions because he used it every day with those four packs of cigarettes. Third thing on the side table was this. A glass of water with his teeth in it. Some of you remember those days too, right? There was no ashtray on the side table. And you will ask, how did he put out the butts of his cigarettes? He put them out on the, on the sides of his chair, his big red velvet chair. It was potmarked with holes. He put them out in his suit pocket, he wore a suit every day. He put them out on the dash of his Cadillac. That's where he put out his, his cigarettes. But I would jump into Zadie's lap. He was the most loving man. He'd put me in a leg lock because he had these enormous legs from schlepping all those produce bags, right? 50 pound bags of potato. He'd put me in a leg lock like a world wrestling wrestler, you know, World Wrestling Federation wrestler. I was a prisoner of his love. I couldn't get out of that leg lock. And he would look me in the eye. He'd give me a big, wet, scratchy kiss, and he would say to me, Rani, you're the best boy in the United States of America. He loved the United States of America. I gave him everything. And I'd say, I know Zadie, because he did this every time I saw him, you know. He said, let me go, let me go. No, I'm you know, like, I'm eight years old. He said, let me go, Zadie. No, no, no. He looked me in the eye again. He'd say, Rani, you're the best boy in the United States of America. I'd say, I know, Zadie, get let me out of here. Third time, Ronnie, you're the best boy in the United States of America. And finally, he let me go. Then my brother Bobby would come around the corner. He would jump into Zadie's lap. Zadie would put him in a leg lock. He would give him a big, wet, scratchy kiss. And he would say, Bobby, you're the best boy in the United States of America. <laughs> my brother Dougie, Dougie, you're the best boy in the United States of America. Now, what do you think I learned from that experience? From my Zadie, all nine of his Eniklach, his grandchildren were the best boy or the best girl in the United States of America. He wasn't really calling us the best boy or best girl. He was calling us to be the best boy we could be, to be the best girl we could be. That's what he was doing. And because I'm sharing that story with you today, I am his legacy. I am keeping his memory alive. I am his legacy. So this question is, whether you have children, grandchildren, foster children, mentor children, teach children, what have you done to influence the next generation? That's part of your legacy. And you're gonna be asked about it when you get to heaven. The next question, if we go back to the text, is this. Sipita lishua. Do you see it? Sipita lishua. Did you wait in hope for the messianic salvation? What? Salvation? That's a Christian concept, isn't it? No, it's a Jewish concept. They took all our best stuff. Did you know the Havdalah service on Saturday night? That's, that's salvation. 
please God, be our salvation. The key word is tsipita, hope. Did you live your life with hope or did you live your life in fear? Have you ever been in a waiting room in a hospital where a loved one was having a procedure or was sick? I was in a waiting room a number of years ago with my wife, Susie. This was probably 12 years ago. We had been in Australia on a long trip and she was having trouble walking uh, between the gates in the airport to the baggage claim without stopping to catch her breath. And my dad was a heart patient, so I knew that something was wrong. I said, honey, when we get back to Los Angeles, we have to check this out. The next thing I know, they're wheeling Susie into the heart catheterization laboratory at Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Los Angeles to look inside her heart. It happened so fast, our children couldn't be with me. So I was alone in the waiting room in that hospital. And I'm telling you folks, I was vacillating between these two emotions, hope and fear. I hope they could find whatever was causing this shortness of breath. And I feared that if they found something, they'd have to open her up. She'd have a zipper in an open heart surgery. Hope and fear, hope and fear. About an hour later, the doctor appears at the front door of this waiting room. It says, Mr. Wolfson, I have news. Your wife did fine. Now my hope factor goes way up. But he says, now my fear factor kicks in. We found a 95% blockage in her heart, an artery in her heart. My fe I, I, I almost fainted. And then he said, we were able to find it and stent it. We ballooned it and put a stent in there and she should do just fine. You'll see her in an hour in the recovery room. When I saw her, she was still on the gurney. She was all excited to tell me about it. She said, there was a big screen television. I watched the whole thing. I gave her a kiss with tears streaming down my face. And I said, honey, we really dodged a bullet. She says, I know, I know. So this question is, did you live your life in fear or in hope? And boy, these last few two years with pandemic, I don't know about you, but I've had those two emotions, living in hope, living in fear of contracting this terrible virus. You'll be asked about it when you get to heaven. Did you live your life in, with hope? Here are the next, the next questions that I combine in the book. We're now on the line that starts messianic salvation. You all see that? Pilpalta b'chokma, did you delve into wisdom? And Havanta Davar Mitok Davar. When you learn Torah, did you learn it deeply and infer one thing from another? Davar Mitok Davar, one thing from another. Now, the key words here are Chokma and Hevanta. Chokma, many of you know, is the word for wisdom. Now, where do you get wisdom? You get wisdom from hard-won experience in life. And Havanta comes from the Hebrew word bina, understanding, referring to your intellectual abilities. So I combine these two questions into one because I think they're related. Havanta davar mitoch davar. First, pilpata b'chachma. Did you achieve wisdom and did you use your wisdom and Havanta, your, your Bina, your understanding, your intellectual capacity to figure out one thing from another? In other words, your priorities. Did you figure out what was really important in life <clears throat> and spend your time doing that? One thing from another. 
my dad was an inventor and um, he was a dental technician. And we can, turn, we can take this off now, the text pan, thank you. My dad was a dental technician in World War II and he dreamed of inventing a toothbrush that could brush both sides of your teeth at the same time. No kidding. He thought it'd be good for elderly people and for animals. And he was draying about it. You know what a dray cup is in Yiddish? A dray cup is someone who's always spinning, like a dreidel. So one day he's doing his cardiac rehab in a shopping mall and he sees a custodian pushing a floor polisher, Eureka. The floor polisher brush was like a round brush. He said, if I take two round brushes and I put them opposite each other and the teeth go in the middle, I can brush both sides of the teeth at the same time. Brilliant. He takes his invention to an uh, inventor's fair in Nebraska City, Nebraska. Would you believe it? Someone bought it. It was the epilady people. Any of the women on the call remember what an epilady was? It was a, an instrument for women to take the hair off their legs. It was invented by a South African Jewish family. They sold millions of these things. They bought my dad's invention. They were going to call it Epident. They were ready to put it on a national advertising campaign. And then the week before it was to go public, turns out that the four daughters in the family had spent a lot of the family's fortune. One invested $4 million in a Broadway play in New York that began their shows on Thursday night and closed on Friday. The company went bankrupt just as my dad's invention was coming to market. But you know what I learned from that? I learned that he was tenacious, that he figured out one thing from another, that he followed his dreams. And that was a lesson that myself and my two brothers learned to carry with us in our lives. When you get to heaven, you'll be asked about this. Did you figure out what was really important to spend time on in your lives? So now let's look at the last two questions. The seventh, the sixth question now comes from this fabulous story. Rabbi Shimshon Ralph Leah Hirsch, this father of modern orthodoxy. It is said he was on his deathbed in Germany. He lived in Germany. And his students gathered around him and they asked him, Rabbi, is there anything we can do for you? And the rabbi surprised his students by saying this, yes, take me to Switzerland. And the students said, rabbi, you're so ill. Why do you want to go to Switzerland? And the rabbi is said to have said to his students, because soon I will meet the almighty. And how will I answer when the almighty asks me, did you see my Alps? Did you see my Alps? What a great question. This is a question that you'll be asked in heaven, not about what you did during your life, but what you did not do during your life. You know, and Judaism permits us to do almost everything to enjoy all of God's creation and blessings, except one day of the year. You know what day of the year it is. Come on, everyone together. What day of the year are you not allowed to do almost anything? except Yom be in the Kippur. synagogue and pray all day. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, exactly right. Now, I don't know about you, but I, Yom Kippur is my favorite spiritual moment of the year. It is. I do all sorts of things to, to reflect and to pray and to get in that high spiritual place. I fast all day. I, I'm at services all day. I don't wear leather, it's a sign of luxury. So I wear sneakers to the synagogue. I don't bathe, shave, or wear cologne. I don't have intimate relationship with Susie. She doesn't mind because I don't bathe, shave, or wear cologne. Uh, my neighbor wears a white robe to shul. You know what it is? It's not a robe, it's a kittel. It's a burial shroud. 
because on Yom Kippur, we're rehearsing this moment when we reach the gates of heaven and we're asked these questions about how we lived our lives on earth. And then at the end of Yom Kippur, what do we do? I'm sure you do this in Denver and you do it in Arizona. We do it here in Los Angeles. We do it in Omaha for sure. People run out of the synagogue to break fasts. We break the fast together. The best break fast in the United States of America, my cousins, Don and Nancy Greenberg in Omaha, Nebraska. For 35 years, Don and Nancy invite 120 people to their home, their beautiful home, no kidding. 120 people get invited to their home to enjoy a buffet of, get this, smoked fish from Barney Greengrass in New York City, the sturgeon king of New York City. I wanna tell you folks, for landlocked Jews in Omaha, Nebraska, this is a feast. I mean, there's Nova Locks, there's pickled herring, there's pickled lox and cream sauce, there are New York bagels. It is unbelievable. That's the big attraction for this breakfast that they put on. True story. A number of years ago, I was visiting New York City and I met with some, a rabbi friend of mine, Roly Matalon from B'nai Jeshurun in New York. And I said, Roly, could we meet at Barney Greengrass? Because I like their pickle lox and cream sauce. That's a, a marinated piece of salmon filet, like a herring, but it's salmon upscale in that wonderful buttermilk uh, cream sauce with uh, sweet onions. Roly said, fine, let's go there for lunch. We go to Barney Greegrass for lunch. We have our meeting and I go to pay the bill. Sitting at the entrance of his store behind a counter was this very large man, Mo Greengrass, the, that, the owner at the time, he has since passed away, may he rest in peace. And he is looking at all of these notes and bills and all sorts of papers on the counter in front of him. Uh, paying no attention to me. But I'm a kind of relational guy. You know, I wrote a book called Relational Judaism. So I want to schmooze with him. So I try to engage him in conversation. And this is what I said. Hey, you don't know me. My name is Ron Wolfson. I'm from Los Angeles. But I think you know my cousins, Don and Nancy Greenberg from Omaha, Nebraska. They get fish from you for Yom Kippur breakfast. As soon as I said the names, Don and Nancy Greenberg, Mo Greengrass, whose head was down like this, looking at the papers, slowly, slowly, slowly raises his head, looks me in the eye, and says, Good account. Good account. Then he says, Don and Nancy Greenberg, 9104 Davenport, Omaha, Nebraska, 68114. He knew their address by heart. Good account. The goal of this work of Cheshbon HaNefesh, the spiritual accounting of the soul, the purpose of Yom Kippur, and the purpose of my book, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven. So here comes the seventh question. The last question is the famous question of Rabbi Zussia. I'm sure many of you know the story. It is said he was on his deathbed. And his students asked, Rebbe, is there anything you worry about when you get to heaven? And Zussia says to them, his students, I'm not worried I'll be asked, why weren't you like Moses? Why weren't you like King David? I am worried. They will, I will be asked, why weren't you Zussia? Some of you might remember this television commercial of the 20th century. Be all that you can be. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody remember what organization put out that ad? The be Army. That's right, it was the army. It went like this, be all that you can be, 
find your future in the army. It was ranked among the top commercials of the 20th century, along with this one. You deserve a break today from somebody. McDonald's. Thank you, McDonald's. And a third one, one of my favorites, Pepsi Cola hits the spot. 12 full ounces, that's a lot. Twice I love you. Two, Thank Pepsi you. Cola is the drink for you. <laughs> We're showing Not owned our an advertising age. agency, Ronnie. We're showing our age, aren't we? This is the question. Did you use all of your God-given talents, spiritual gifts, and passions to make a difference in the world? Were you God's partner in continuing God's creation, fixing what was broken, fighting for social justice, doing your part in creating a spiritual community of belonging and blessing? Were you the best you you could be? That's the seventh question you'll be asked in heaven about how you lived your life on earth. So I'm gonna pause for a minute. Does anybody have a response or a question before we finish up our learning together? You can unmute or you can put the question in the chat and then we can, we'll wrap up. Because I have a very special surprise to share with you. Debbie Denneberg's in the house. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Oh, you're giving me all these wonderful answers. Thank you. You're Anybody welcome. have a response, a comment? To think some more about it, all those wonderful things you said. Yeah. There are a series of very excellent questions. Um, okay, then I'm going to share with you this last little piece. Remember I told you about my mom. My brothers and I got a phone call uh, to come quick to Omaha because my mother was in a delirium in the hospital in Omaha. She came out of it uh, for about a week before she passed away. Uh, and during that week, we got to say our goodbyes. And she knew that this book, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven, was going to come out shortly. I said, Mom, the first copy is out, and I'm really excited about it. And she said, Ronnie, that's wonderful. What's your next book? That's what she asked me. <laughs> What's your next book? Three days after she died, <clears throat> my brother Bobby and I were looking through her stuff. My mother ran our family. My father had nothing to do with running the family. I mean, he never bought himself a piece of clothing. He never, like, my mother would lay out his clothes. You want to, you want to know the relationship about, between my mother and my father? I was once visiting them, and my mother said to my father, kind of yelled at him, Alan, put on a sweater. And my father answered, are we going out? Or am I cold? I think that's the funniest thing I ever heard. So she had a little blue notebook. And in the little blue notebook were all of her important numbers, you know, phone numbers and bank accounts and insurance numbers and all that kind of stuff. So Bobby and I are looking through this notebook, this little notebook. And suddenly we see in the inside cover of the notebook was a letter, a, a, an envelope, a little white envelope like this. And it had the word important on it. And we look at it and we say, what could this possibly be? Did she have like a secret bank account? You know, what could be in this envelope? And we open it up. Bobby hands it to me because I'm the oldest. And I, I open it up and I see inside there's a letter. It was a letter from my mother to her three boys. And Dougie, our youngest, was not there at the time. So we said, tonight at the Shiva, 
I'm not, I put it back in the envelope. I didn't want to read it. I said, after the Shiva minion tonight, we'll read the book, we'll read this letter together. <clears throat> you know, when I wrote this book, The Seven Questions You're Asked in Heaven, I realized it was kind of an ethical will. It was kind of like, you know, this is what's really important. Well, guess what? This letter was my mother's ethical will that she wrote to her boys. And with your permission, I'd like to read it to you. It is the most beautiful, well-constructed, unbelievable letter that I've ever read in all of my years. It's in her, look at this, Bernice Wolfson and in her beautiful handwriting. So it must have been done well before she got really sick. To my dear sons, first of all, I love you and I'm proud of all three of you. As I write this, my heart fills with pride for your roles as devoted husbands and particularly your roles as wonderful fathers. This of course is the greatest gift a child can give a parent. Second page. Someday when you read this, you will also be reminded that as a parent, another great gift you have given me is the comfort of knowing you care for each other and that you will be there for each other if you need to be. My simple request is that you talk to each other often after your mother is no longer here to keep you posted. Please keep in touch with Doug. He has a very special challenge in his life and needs the support of people who love and understand him. You have filled my life with pleasure. And the most I can wish for you is that your children do the same for you. I love you, Ron, Bob, and Doug. And thank you for giving my life so much meaning. And she signs it, your mother. How gorgeous is that? It's the most treasured letter in our lives. I hope you can write a letter like this to your loved ones. Don't wait, do it. You might be asked about it when you get to heaven. So were you honest in your business? Did you fix a time to study Torah? Did you influence the next generation? Did you live with hope in your heart? Even in bad times? Did you figure out with your understanding your experience from wis your wisdom, from experience and your understanding, what's really important, your priorities. Did you see the Alps? Did you enjoy everything of God's creation? And were you the best you you could be? You know the cool thing about this, these questions? We get to know them now. We get to know them now and we can do something about it. Heaven, heaven can wait. Hey, thank you all for inviting me to share this teaching with you today. I hope it's made you think and I hope you can take it with you in your own lives. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron Wolfson. That was uh, very moving and um, gave us a lot to think about. Is there anyone after all of that that has a question to follow up? Um, are you still probably taking this in? But um, we do have about 10 to 15 more minutes. So please let us know if there's a question and, and go ahead and unmute yourself. I have a question. Please. Will, we be, will we be able to see this program again? Well, it's recorded. It will is it recorded. It will take about one to two business days to post online and you can find it um, from Valley Bait Madrash's website under the learning library link. I will go ahead and put that in the chat right now. 
Thank you. Can we wish Ron Wilson happiness? Uh, my wife is a graduate of the UGA programs that he was doing there. Wizen. Oh, yep. very nice. And I've been using Wizen stuff for years and wearing a Wizen t-shirt. <laughs> and you're making it clear series of books people ought to know about how to do a Seder, et cetera. These are very helpful, positive, constructive, do it yourself at the same time doing it right. And thank uh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Bob. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, I did those books back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. There's oh, a book yeah. On Shabbat, there's a book on Passover, one on Hanukkah, and one on mourning and comforting. And, um, you know, at this time of year, as we're getting close to Purim, people say to me, I always take that book off the shelf uh, you know, <laughs> to, to get ready for Pesach because there's so many yep. good ideas. Oh, look, he's got the Shabbat book. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Please. Uh, My please. pleasure. My, My pleasure. pleasure. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Good to see you. Same here. Uh, do I still get to call you Ronnie or do I have to call you Dr. Ronnie? Like everybody else. Okay. Ronnie, so, please. So, um, I'm teaching a class in financial literacy for teenagers through a Jewish Ooh. lens, though. This is a this is a Bethel class. So you want to can you just since we have a little extra time, will you hit that first question again if you were talking to teenagers? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great question to teach them. Mm -hmm. Did you conduct your life in all aspects of it? Um, it with Emuna faithfully. Like I said, Debbie, the question for teenagers is, are you honest in your relationships? Not just dealing with financial issues. You know, because in my book, Relational Judaism, I make the point that our communities, our sacred communities especially, should try to move from transactional relationships with our people. Like, you know, you pay us dues and we give you a rabbi on call and we get high holiday seats and we give you, a, a, you know, a, a religious school, a bar mitzvah for your kids, bat mitzvah, to move from transactional to relational. So it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing in dealing with finances. You know, build a relationship with the people, do it with honesty. You know, in my book, uh, in my memoir, The Best Boy in the United States of America, this book, by the way, this is me, that's me, I'm eight years old for Hanukkah, I, or Purim. I dressed up as a cowboy. I still dress up as a cowboy for Purim. Yeah, yeah. So in this book, one of my favorite stories, uh, Debbie knows this, our rabbi growing up in Omaha, Bethel Synagogue, uh, Meyer Kripke, may he rest in peace, uh, was a good friend of Warren Buffett. Do you all know that name, Warren Buffett? Uh, he's a, an interesting guy. And I would say that people who know Warren will tell you he's an honest guy in business. You know, he, he, bought, um, he bought that uh, company in Nebraska called Nebraska Furniture Mart on a handshake with Mrs. Blumkin. And uh, Mrs. B, they called her. So Rabbi Kripke, uh, funded the Kripke Institute, which has now published uh, three books. Uh, the newest one that just came out, the newest two, well, this was, was mentioned, Raising A Plus Human Beings, which has a chapter in it for our parents and grandparents about how to partner with schools to raise uh, children who are kind, who don't use Shon Hara. It's a wonderful book. You can find it on, um, Relational, uh, no, raising a plus a plus human beings .com. This book just came out, creating sacred communities. Leading practitioners share lessons learned. This is from my rabbinical school class at the Ziegler School at American Jewish University. Fourteen of the best creators of sacred communities I interviewed for the class. And, but in this book, I tell the story of how I took Rabbi Kripke to meet Warren Buffett. Uh, not to meet him, but to re-engage with Warren. Because we had set up this institute and I was hoping Warren would give some money to the institute. So I take Rabbi Kripke down to see Warren Buffett. Of course, I wanted to meet the famous Warren Buffett. 
This was in August of 2006. And it was a tough time in Israel. There was the Lebanese war. They had captured the three Israeli soldiers. And Warren had announced that he had bought a company in Israel for a billion dollars, for $4 billion, called Iskar. So uh, he was planning to go to Israel in September to meet War the, the family, the Wertheimer family. So we have this meeting with him in his office in Omaha. And we ask him, Rabbi asks him to contribute. And he says, Ron, I only know how to make dough. I don't know how to give it away. Is that a, that's an Omaha thing. That's a Warren Buffett thing. But at the end of the meeting, I didn't want it to end uh, on a negative note. So I said to him, you know, Warren, I hear you're going to Israel next month. He said, yes, I'm very excited about it. I said, well, you know, in the Jewish tradition, if you hear someone going to Israel, you give, you give them some money to take. Do you know this tradition? It, it's, it, what does it do? It makes the person who's taking your money to Israel, your shaliach messenger, your angel messenger, because you're going to give money to someone who needs it. The person who gets it in Israel thinks it's from the pilgrim to Israel. It's not. It's from the person who gave you the money to take. And God will protect you on your journey. I'm telling Warren Buffett this story. And then I said to him, Warren, I've got something for you. And I, Ron Wolfson, gave Warren Buffett a dollar bill. And he took it. <laughs> he took it. And he took it to Israel. And I was so excited about this. I wrote him a thank you note. And I asked him how his trip was. And it was, he was a huge smash kid in Israel. He was only there for 48 hours. But Israel was so excited that Warren Buffett, the famous Warren Buffett came. So I wrote him a letter and asked him about the trip. And then I said, you know, Warren, in front of the rabbi, I didn't want to ask you for an autograph in front of the rabbi. But I'd really like an autograph from you for my grandchildren. So I put this in the book. You, can you see this? It says, not a recent likeness. It's a caricature of Warren Buffett. And the inscription reads, to Ron, who has the same rabbi as I do, Warren <laughs> Buffett. You should, have asked him to, you should have asked him to sign a dollar bill. <laughs> yeah, he took the dollar bill. <laughs> I've been very blessed in my life to have wonderful stories that illustrate these points, these educational points. And it's my pleasure to bring it to people through the books and through my speaking and teaching. And I'm just so honored to have been with all of you today at the Valley Bank Midrash. I think Reb Shmuley is one of the great Jewish educators in the world. Uh, so I feel very honored to be with you. And I want to wish you all a happy Purim coming up. And may we pray for uh, our colleagues and our, our loved ones in the Ukraine. And let's hope that there's peace soon. Uh, so uh, much love to all of you. Think about the questions you're asked in heaven. Do something about it. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank, you, much, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Wilson. You. And thank you to our partners, the HEA, the Hebrew Educational Alliance in Denver, to Rabbi Sherry and Laura for the introduction. And for any of you who'd like to join us again next week, um, we are learning with Rabbi Sharona Halikman on Thursday for the significance of the mitzvot of Purim in our lives today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.